Good morning. Well, that was really loud. I don't even have to talk that loud when you have a microphone. Uh, welcome this morning. We're glad you are here. Any visitors we have, welcome and come back often. Looks a little, everybody's just kind of spread out. Nobody's sitting in the front. I have a few announcements. There's no flyer, no junior youth tonight. We have no internet. As you can see, there's no screen, so we'll be using the hymnals. We're going to do it the old-fashioned way. And uh, the, there is Facebook, and so if a lot of people join us on Facebook, which is another avenue. And, you know, God can use the internet to, to help us, but Satan can always uh, be there to distract it, too. So it seems like there's... I mean, we don't have internet at our house e either, so it's on the same same line. So weather can relate to that, and it, I just feel like Satan can just get in there and, and really do some things as well to distort or stop us from doing different things. So, But he can't stop us from worshiping here you know, with us, so that's uh, always good. My uh, point, uh, point to ponder... You know, I can't come up with any good quotes, so I just always take them or see them on the, if I'm on the road. And the only thing that you can take to heaven is your neighbor. Think about that one. Let's worship. Good morning. I am excited to be here to worship with you this morning. Thank you for being here. And Thank you for tuning in on the Facebook Live as well. I have two announcements this morning. The first is there's an insert in the bulletin uh, about the National Day of Prayer. And uh, at 8 a.m., if you would like to join uh, some of the people who will be joining together for the National Day of Prayer, uh, they're getting together at the IMH flagpole, which is on the corner there where the hospital and the resident home is located at. And so they uh, start at 8 a.m. and there's kind of a service there for that. So you, you've all been invited to that if you would like to do that as well. Uh, the second announcement I have is that I would ask that you would join me in praying um, through an inquiry that, has, that I have received um, from a congregation. And so I'll be praying through that and ask that you would join me as, as I do that, please. Um, I appreciate your help with that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made that I have not made? We begin the service this morning then in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 30, and it's a responsive reading. If you would turn, please, to page... 122 in your hymnal, Psalm 30 is a psalm of David, the congregation will read the bold, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from Sheol, thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. O Lord, by thy favor thou hast made mountains to stand strong. Thou didst hide the face, I was dismayed. What profit is there in blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise thee? Will it declare thy faithfulness? Thou hast turned from me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. That my soul may sing praise to thee, and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to thee forever. Join me in opening prayer. Dear Lord, 
we do rejoice this morning. We praise your name. And it is true, Lord, that if we would remain silent, that the rocks could cry out, that dust could praise you. We praise you, Lord Jesus, this morning for many wonderful things. Our salvation, the life you give, the fact that you are continually faithful to us. We are ever glad and ever thankful. We ask, Lord Jesus, that this morning that you would be glorified, that you would be praised, that you would come here and rest your spirit and your countenance upon us, that it your spirit would move mightily with your word. That it would penetrate the places of our life that darkness lifts. The places where our heart is yet hardened. The places we have yet to surrender. Reach us even to this most depth in every place that we are, Lord. May it be that we leave changed because of you. Be lifted high. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing together Beautiful Savior, number 177. Please rise as we continue worshiping by confessing our sins. And we're going to do that through him this morning. You know, we, I do that often where we change the way in which we do. And so as you sing today, number 533 at Calvary, I would ask that you would continue, uh, in a sense, confess of who you are inside and your need for Christ as you sing this song. 
in our confession of sin. This being your sincere confession, if with a penitent heart you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all your sins. And by the authority of God's word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I can declare to you that God, through his grace, has forgiven all your sins. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. We will call on the scripture reader at this time. The first lesson is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to, into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, 
Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias came in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to, to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias says, departed and entered into the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for, the, for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. The epistle lesson is from Revelations chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God, for every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders of the voice, many angels numbering myriads of myriads of thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all them that is saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Here ends the reading. Please rise for the reading of the gospel text. The gospel text comes from John chapter 21. It's verse 1 through 19 and is also the text for today's message. Reading in Christ's name. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That the disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. 
When they got out, of, out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled in the net ashore full of large fish. For them and all there, there was so many that the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and, so the, and some of the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When, the, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to them, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he, and he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you were used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you, were stretched, you stretched out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you go, do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Here ends the reading. Today, being that we will come to the altar of our Lord and take part in receiving of the body and blood and the bread and wine, we will confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which can be found on page 18 in the hymnal. Again, we will confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which is found on page 18 in the hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the scripture or the children at this time for the children's message. All right. So I think the bag's going to be down here, right? 
Oh, he... Oh, man, for a second, I thought you had a pair of underwear you were going to give me. I got scared for a second. That would, have been, that would have been a really tough one. So what is this? Yeah, it's an army man. How many, of, how many of you guys had this when you were a kid? This was like one of my favorite things. They make them way better now, don't they? Mine was like this really chunky piece of plastic, and like the, the parachute was plastic, I think, maybe. It was bad. This is like, I almost feel like I could put this on and jump off, and I'd be good. That's how well-built this one is, right? So, whoo. All right, now what, what is the point of a parachute? Yeah, they use them when they're jumping out of, of the airplanes, right? And sometimes, because what is this here? Well, look, look at it closely. Yeah, it's an army person, isn't it? So when they're, when they're about ready to go into battle, when they have to go into places, sometimes they have to be taken far out into enemy territory. In order to do that, they have to jump out of a helicopter, or they have to jump out of an airplane, and they use a parachute because what would happen if they didn't have the parachute? Yeah. And you know what? The parachute isn't even, that's not even certain that you will live, is it? Yeah, sometimes you can get cut from tree and die. Well, something like that. Or what? What would you like to say? My mom was, was on this really funny blanket and she fell right into the water. Oh. Don't you, like, you, you don't know, you're like, I don't know what she's talking about. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, she wouldn't be saying it if it's not true. So don't try to deny it back there. <laughs> I know enough about her to know that she's saying the truth. So, so one time I was watching a video of a couple parachuters. They jumped out of the plane, and one of them was falling too fast and a little out of control, and he hit another one. And when he hit the other one, this person passed out and started to fall. And a third person was back here. And this person came, and he came, yeah, and he, and he grabbed him and then pulled his parachute for him so that he could not die. That's a better picture of what Christ does for us. We think we're prepared, right? We think we're ready to go. We think we're ready for battle. We think we've got everything we need. And then something happens drastically as we go out into life. And and it really happens right from when we're born, right? We are tainted with sin. We have failure from the very beginning. And it's something that we cannot help. The person who was skydiving when he was over here and he got hit, he had no idea that this person was coming. He couldn't even get out of the way. And when he got hit, he was completely out of control. If the other person would not have come and pulled his parachute for him and saved him, he would have died. He never would have known that he was dead. That's how dead he was. He was in such great need of help. He didn't even know he needed help. That's what God does for us. In our desperate state, he comes and he saves us. And we didn't even know that we were in trouble. We didn't even know that we were in danger. We didn't even know we needed help. So now that we do know, what do we do? What do you think we do? What would you do if somebody saved you? What would you do? James, what would you do if somebody saved you and pulled your parachute and saved you? I would say thank you and hug him. Yeah, you would, as soon as you got on the ground, right? You would run to that guy and you would hug him and you would say, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you saved me. That's what we do. And we do that by, how do we do that? How do we say thank you to Jesus? Praying is one, yep. What else? Praise, right? What else? Going to church, that's right. We worship him. That's another way, yep. So today we're going to pray. Hey, this was a really good one. Good job. All right, arms out. Arms together. Dear Heavenly Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for saving us. And you did that, Lord, without it us even asking. We had no idea we needed to do anything. We had no idea we even needed to ask. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Continue to work in us faith. Continue to keep us close and near to you. In your holy and precious name, amen. Good job, guys. Dane? Charlotte. Charlotte? All right. Charlotte. Is she up here? Oh, there she is. I can't believe I didn't even see you. You're the only one over here that looks just like you. <laughs> so come on. Thank you, guys. Have a seat. Let us prepare for the message by singing together hymn number 460, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, number 460. Today's text comes from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19, and it was one of our scripture lessons today, so I won't read through it as we begin here, but let us join together in praying uh, this morning before we begin. Jesus, this is, uh, this is your altar. This place has been dedicated to you. These people have come because they are yours. These are your sheep, and, and so, Lord, speak to them. Feed, feed them now, Lord. You know each and every heart. You know each and every person with each and every struggle. You know in each and everything that, that could distract us. You know everything that might try to stop us from hearing what you would have for us today. And I pray, Lord, that none of those things would be successful. That you would go forth with your word and spirit, that you would speak, that even myself would digress, O oh Lord, and that you would increase in this moment now. We long, long to look into you, to hear from you, to be with you, to worship you. May that, may that become reality in this moment, Lord. In your holy and precious name, amen. The main focus for today's message is going to be on 15 through 17, really. 
the two, two verses there towards the end, but we'll begin in verse 1. And I, I know I've heard this message, and I, I know that I've heard some of the things that, that have been claimed uh, about this passage. And, uh, you know, I remember being taught this in, in seminary, and there's a bunch of different things that come around this. And yet, you know, I, I hope that as you hear this message today, as you, as you walk with me through this passage of Scripture, that you too would be encouraged the way I was encouraged uh, from, from Christ this week as I prepared it begins, it says, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. So that, that's the Sea of Galilee. And he manifests himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, that means the twin, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee. Now remember, that's James and John, Right? The sons of Zebedee. Now, also remember, if you guys remember, it was, what, two years back when we did our, our Sunday school lessons on the disciples. Maybe it's been three years now. But if you remember that before the disciples were called by Jesus, that, that Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John, they were kind of together as a group of fishermen. They, they, ran the, they did the business together. So now, if you think about this as, as Jesus, or as G Peter, in a sense, is maybe he's not sure what he's supposed to do. Maybe he just needed a break. Maybe he needed something that seemed normal. As he says, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go fishing. As they were all together, the, and two other disciples were together, so Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And I suppose we don't need to make too big of a deal of this, right? We don't need to make a big point on the fact that that Peter didn't know what he was doing, so he's going back to do what he was typically did. And, and maybe that's true, maybe it's not, and I think maybe even I've stressed that point before. But in any case, I can understand where Peter is standing. He's unsure. He's unsure of what the future holds. He's unsure of what's going to happen. The last three years of training... The last three years of walking with the Lord, probably the best three years of his life, have come to an end. What, what's the plan now? What? And so that there's this uncertainty. Now, even though there's uncertainty that surrounds that for Peter, the truth is, is that God is absolutely certain of his future. God is absolutely aware of what's taking place, right? Even if Peter is not. What I love about this moment is that Peter, I'm going fishing. And instead of having to go by himself, those people that he had spent the last three years with say, I'll go with you. Isn't that a, a wonderful picture of what the congregation is to look like? Walking together through the different struggles that we are all faced with. In Peter's uncertainty, in the disciples' uncertainty, they could have pouted on shore, they could have whatever is done, but as Peter says, I'm just, I'm going to go fishing. They're, they're like, hey, all right, let's go. There wasn't, well, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to go fishing. Well, I'm going to go, I guess I'll go do this, you know. No, they stayed together. What a beautiful picture of, of walking life together. And it, and it seems to me as they say that, it, was, it, it wasn't a difficult decision, right? It wasn't like something, well, so hard to decide if I want to really go fish. I really don't like to fish. Fishing's a lot of work. No, they went ahead and they just went with him. I hope that we look at each other in the same way. I hope that as a church, that's, that is our heart together. As we recognize when somebody else might be struggling, might be going through something, that we shout. And we don't just say, I am with you, but that we actually do something, right? One of my biggest frustrations with the stuff that's going on in Ukraine is I feel like a lot of the world is saying, we support you. 
We're united with Ukraine. What are we doing? Here's some money. Well, great. <laughs> what am I going to do with that? They need help. That means they need people there to help them, right? If we want to support them, if we believe they need to be supported, then why wouldn't we send troops? That's my argument behind it. That means that what I'm getting at for us as a congregation, what I see in the disciples is when they saw they were together, they were unified, they were visibly, physically present with each other. This is what I hope for for us as a congregation. Now, as they went out, uh, they, went, they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was not now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, they're only 100 yards away, so I suppose maybe they're a little bit older and they don't have glasses, so you know, maybe they can't tell that it's Jesus. But I'm still perplexed that every time they say they don't know that it was him, Right? I mean, you would think that they would know that it was him. So I, I have no answer. I cannot tell you why they don't recognize him. I wish I knew the answer to this question. And obviously, it doesn't matter. Because if it did matter, God would tell us why in the scripture. But it's so perplexing every time that I see that they don't recognize him. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Jesus knew that they didn't recognize him. Right? So he does something that he's always done to them or done before to be like, hello, it's me. Not catching any fish all night long and then casting the net over and according to uh, here, it says that they end up catching 153 fish in verse 11. So you go from nothing to 153 like that. Yep, it's the Lord. <laughs> That's undeniable. That's him, right? And I love the fact that therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved. The one thing that I love about John's gospel is that when he names himself, he doesn't name himself John, right? Right? He doesn't say who he is. He just says he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so he's like, I beat him to the grave. You know, I told him that it was the Lord. Like, I don't know. I don't think he's boasting, but it's, it's kind of fun to see that kind of little bit reminder. And, and I suppose when John's writing it, because he's not saying his name, he's feeling like maybe he's not drawing attention to himself. He's not being prideful because he's not even mentioning himself. He's like, that guy that, that Jesus loved, he's the one who said, it's the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. That is Peter to a T, right? Oh, it's the Lord? I don't care about the fish. I don't care that I was just fishing all night. I'm going to swim to shore. Sorry, guys. Go ahead and bring the haul in yourselves. Right? For that mo in that moment, the whole purpose that he went fishing disappeared. There he is, the Lord. It doesn't matter anymore, anything else. The only thing that matters is Christ. And so he goes upon shore. The other disciples came in the little boat. They were not far off a lawn, about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got on land, they saw a charcoal file already laid, fish placed on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured question him, who are you? <laughs> Knowing that it was the Lord. And so yet this, this mystery they're standing right next to him. They saw him come in the room. They touched him. They've seen him several times. This is now the third time, it says, in verse 14, that Jesus manifests himself to the disciples. But they dare not question who you are. That means that somewhere inside of there, they almost wanted to ask the question, who are you? Have you ever 
Though you know the Lord exists, you know he's active in your life, and yet there's this little thing inside of you sometimes that goes, Lord, are you watching? I know you're all-knowing, but do you know what's going on over here? Do you see what these people are doing? Do you see how this is going? We have that in us, don't we? It's not far-fetched for us to understand what they're thinking. I don't know why they don't recognize him, but they dared not question. They dared not. They knew it was him. Not because they recognized, it seems like, with their eyes, but they recognized who he was for who he is and what he does. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because sometimes our sight and what we see and how we perceive that, sometimes that can be misleading. When we begin to judge subjectively whether God exists, whether he loves us, or all those things, it's hard for us to do that correctly. It's hard for us to get it right. But when we judge what we see, what we perceive across who Christ is and what he's done, namely the fact that that has been recorded in Scripture, we recognize that we're standing on something else then, don't we? That we're not judging it based on my feeling. Now, understand what I'm saying, because this is leading into something. We're not basing it on my feeling. We're basing it on something that is solid, that is real, that is objective outside of me. I don't get to determine its truth. He already once showed me who he was and what he does. And when he does it a second time, then I know who he is and what he does. As we get into verse 15 through 17, Jesus teaches like he's always taught, magnificently. And it's almost hard to see in the English language. In the Greek language, there are two words for love. And, and often when this is taught, it's taught like this. There's agape, which is like complete and full love. And then there's phileo, which is like brotherly love. That's how that's often taught. And that's how I was taught it, in a sense. And I've heard sermons taught that way. Though I don't know that for this particular text, that that is helpful. I want to... Read for you <clears throat> a few sentences that one of the lexicon writers wrote in regards to the distinction between agape love and phileo love in the Greek language. This is from Thayer, and he's the person that I use most often as a, as a lexicon. So in other words, definitions and understanding of the Greek language and grammar. And so... He says this, as to the distinction between agape and phileo, the former, that being agape, by virtue of its connection with another word that is love, properly denotes a love founded in admira ad <clears throat> admiration, esteem, veneration, and it's closely connected, the Latin word, for love, uh, delegare, I don't know Latin, so I'm struggling there, but is closely connected, and that word means to be kindly disposed to one, wish one well. But phileo denotes an inclination prompted by sense and emotion. Okay, recognize the two distance differences then. The differences between the words is not full, complete love and brotherly love, one is about something that is admiration and esteem and understanding. It's objective. And the other is based on sense and emotion. Phileo, which they would call brotherly love, is sense and emotion. So now we get back to this funny way that Jesus calls to Peter and its impact and its importance. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I'm going to go through these from now on, and instead of saying love, I'm going to use the Greek word that's there. Okay? And also recognize 
that as Jesus is talking to him, I don't know that these three questions that Jesus asks are in immediate succession. Though John writes it that way, it could have been that these three questions happen over the course of the time after they had breakfast. I mean, it, it could happen that he, told, he asked them right in a row, but it could also be that there's space in between. Okay, but, but we go this, and it says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, tend my lambs. Now, tend is a command, right? He's not saying, maybe do this, maybe don't do this. He's saying, tend my lambs. It's like if my kid is on the table, I say, get off the table. I'm not saying like, maybe get off the table. Could you please get off the table? No, I'm saying, get off the table. There's the sense of the command here that Jesus in sternness is saying, then tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. So Jesus says to him, shepherd, another command, my sheep. Tend my lambs, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Jesus changed what he said. He doesn't say, do you agape me? He says, do you phileo me? Now, if you would think of these words in complete and utter love and then brotherly love, that, that makes things more confusing for me. Because right after, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, not because he said to him a third time, like he did it three times. No, he's saying that there's a difference in what he said the third time than the first times, and that grieved him. Because Jesus changed what he said. Instead of saying, do you agape me? He said, do you phileo me? That grieved Peter in his heart. Now, I don't know about you, but if, it, if I had been Peter, I would have been challenged then to change my love to say, yes, I agape you. But Peter didn't change what he said. He said to him, Lord, you know all things. And that is key. In that moment, Peter is hiding nothing. He knows that Jesus knows everything. He knows that Jesus knows how much he loves him. He's saying, Jesus, you know the innermost part of me. You remember when I denied you. And I said, I would never deny you. I said, I would die with you before I would deny you. And you know that I denied you. You know I was not perfect. You know I, did not, I was not able. But you know my heart. You know all things. You know that I phileo you. Jesus said to him, another command, ten my sheep. Hmm. Imagine Peter in that moment, right? What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is reminding Peter, you denied me three times. Remember? Remember, you denied me three times. That's why I'm asking three times, maybe, yeah? Be reminded three times. But also, when Peter denied, what kind of choice was that? What kind of choice was that? At the end of this paragraph, this is what Thayer says, the difference between agape and phileo. He says, hence men are said to agape God, not phileo. And God said agape in John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he agaped the world. But then, and phileo, the disciples of Christ in John 16, 27. Christ, here's the thing, Christ bids us agape, not phileo. 
Because love, as an emotion, cannot be commanded. Do you hear that? Love as an emotion cannot be demanded or commanded, but only love as a choice can be commanded. <clears throat> How is it that Christ can command Jesus, tend my sheep, stand in my stead, be my hands and my feet? How can he do that if we are based in emotion? How can you love your spouse if you are swayed by emotion. You cannot fully love and give yourself completely to your spouse if you are ruled by emotions. Because every time something triggers your emotions, your love will be swayed one way or another. Is this not how we get people today who say, I don't love you anymore? But if love is a choice, that it is based on something outside of my interpretation, is objective, and I choose, despite what I think or I feel, to love, then even I, in my innermost being, can command myself to love in a way that is unbecoming of my normal character. I can choose to love. How can I love my enemy? How can I agape my enemy as Christ commands? If it's based on my emotion. Could I ever force my emotions to change? Now, don't get me wrong. God uses emotion. We have emotion because God has emotion. But the truth is that we do not judge them well. And we would be up and down, up and down if we based our salvation and the way God views us, this up and down direction, this justification, if it's based on something that's subjective, like my emotions, I will have no stability in my Christian walk and in my Christian faith. That's pretty deep then, isn't it? As Jesus asks him three times. He's asking him to lay aside the emotion. He's asking him to lay aside those things that are about sense and how you feel. And in the end, Peter says, you know how I feel. You know the darkest, deepest parts of me. You know how I am swayed. You know how I make mistakes. You know that I love you. What a profound moment. Probably the last super great connection of conversation that Jesus has with Peter. Jesus is calling him and reminding him to be stable, not to be swayed by emotion and feeling, but to be stand on the objective truth of who Jesus is. And isn't it interesting then that he uses that very idea to call to them in the boat before the conversation even starts. Remember who I am. Throw the net on the other side. Be reminded of what I can do. Be reminded of what I've done. Be reminded of who I am. Sometimes when we look and we base things on emotion and what we see, what we're going to realize is that there's this still small voice that calls out to us the reality of the objective love and characteristics and truth of Scripture and Christ himself. And this is what we stand on. And we choose to look past what we feel and what we sense and how we think and stand on the truth of Scripture and Christ. This is how we love. As Jesus calls out to Peter to do it this way, he calls out to me and you today to love that same way. 
Not the idea of a complete love versus a brotherly love, but a love that is rested in virtue, characteristics, and truth outside, objective, rather than something that is subjective, based on emotion and feeling. It's not easy, and we will fail constantly, but he's not asking for perfection. He's asking for us to make a distinction. He's asking for us to choose. And we can choose him because he first chose us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for such a great moment that we get to see, that we get to experience because you kept it alive in your scripture, because your word is living and active. You yourself, being the word, are living and active. Be that today for us. Be alive and active. In our life now, may it be that we see truth objectively and choose to love. Help us to love as you have loved. In your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. As we come to the table this morning, if you are visiting, and we have a communion rail that if you believe as we believe that the Lord is really present in body and blood as we take part in the bread and the wine together in fellowship, if you believe this, then you are welcome to come forward with us. The truth is, though, that if we examine ourselves, if we were to look at ourselves and try to determine whether we are able or should come to the communion rail, we're going to find that the only thing that is in us is sin and death and mistakes. And it's for this very reason that Christ took on himself the whole will and law of God in our place, being born, living, and dying, and then raised again, that we would be able to come. So you are not able because of who you are, but because of what you believe he is. Believing and having faith in him allows you to come forward today. And also in that way, he has created this to strengthen that very thing, your assurance of who he is and what he's done. So in, the, in that way, we ask that you would come forward, that you would take part in being united with Christ and being united together as a congregation. Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had eaten, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The elements are now prepared. We'll call the ushers forward to call you forward to the rail.
Welcome to the Lord's table. Body of Christ given for you. 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 May the Lord bless you and keep you. You always walk in his ways. Body of Christ given for you. 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 For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It is Christ who came from heaven and dwelt among men. It is our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen you, preserve you under the true faith and everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's table. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. May you always walk in his ways. Body of Christ given for you. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified and now is risen, he has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen you and preserve you under the true faith and everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen.
Dear Jesus, we come before you. And we know, Lord God, that, that as we pray, it's because you've asked us to pray. You've, you've taught us to pray. You long to speak to us through prayer and to have communication with us. We know, Lord God, that because you long to be active in our life, that, that we do not need to ask you to do so, but, but you are willing to do so. So now as we come before you in prayer, we submit ourselves to you. We stand at the foot of your cross knowing there is no other place. There is no other God. There is only you. Jesus, thank you for redemption, for salvation, for new life, that old things pass away and new things have come. Lord Jesus, continue for us. Help us to see your mercy, your grace, as you are actively working in our life. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would lead this country, that you would guide our nation and its leaders, that you would be with those who serve and protect the one nation under God. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would protect those who serve in our communities, policemen, firefighters, those who are caregivers, EMTs, doctors, nurses. Be with our teachers. Give them boldness to speak the truths of the gospel and to love in every circumstance. Set our feet a dancing. Set our course and light our path. May we walk in the works that you have planned before us. May you go before us. May we not jump in front of you. And so we pray, Lord, the way you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise and receive the benediction. We conclude this service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Please. Oh. It's a good thing that, that Wayne gave me that book called Pastors Are People Too, right? <laughs> Please uh, sing together, Rise Up, O Men of God, number 480, uh, 458 as we close.